episode number 148, Deconstruction and Lift Off Through the Lens of Baroque Flamenco. So I'm Kathleen Wiley, a Jungian psychoanalyst in North Carolina, and I am here with Deborah Henson Conant, a composer, a mentor, or creative. We both play the harp, and that's why we call this Jung at Harp. So um, every week, or almost every week, DHC and I come together to have a conversation. We start with a question, so we don't have answers. <laughs> Hopefully, we will get to some, and you can join in with us um, on whatever platform, if you're watching live, to make comments that we can see. And we'll kind of see what alchemical process cooks up between us all and what answers might emerge. So our question this morning um, got formulated because, Deborah, you were sharing a struggle you're having with communicating what you want to do with your Baroque Flamenco challenge. So you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah. So I'm uh, doing a, a, a musical challenge. I do four challenges a year. And um, this challenge, people were asking, well, what, what is it and how does it work? And I'm struggling to explain what I'm doing in this challenge, because in the other challenges, you know, I teach blues or I teach improvisation or I teach um, um, sort of um, creative resonance. I'm teaching larger concepts. But in this one, I'm breaking apart a, a piece that's known as a big showpiece down to its simplest form and teaching people how to play it in its simplest form. And I, I, and when I was showing it to you earlier this morning and I showed you how I was breaking down and then at a certain point you were like, stop, 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 stop. You just went from level one to like level five. And, um, and I don't always know when I'm going from one level to another. And this particular piece is really powerful for me because it was the first piece that I ever improvised on, on the harp. And it was where I learned that I could improvise. Mm. And I had only been playing for maybe a couple of years. I had my first job where I had to play for like four hours a night. And I only knew four pieces of music. And so it became really essential that I be able to make each of those pieces longer and that I'd be able to improvise. And so this piece, shall I just kind of show what I was showing you? Yeah, yeah so this piece, at this level of my life, you know, decades later, this piece has become this dramatic showpiece concerto that gets played with orchestras around the world. It has developed into this huge thing, similar to how we have each developed from being a child into being an adult with all kinds of capabilities. So the piece itself has grown up. And, um, and yet there's this still this simple, beautiful piece inside of it. And this challenge is all about connecting with that simple, beautiful concept inside of it. And this concept inside has three parts. So this is a deconstruction. I'm deconstructing into three parts. It has a melody, which is this. <laughs> Then it has an, uh, what, I've, what has become for me an improv section. And as we were talking, and I'm going to show that in a second, but you, as we were talking about it, you were saying, okay, but what are people going to learn in this challenge? Are they going to learn, they're going to learn this, this version of this piece, but then what are the other things that they're learning through this piece? So I just want people to think about this as we're going on, that as you and I just explored it, we were like, oh, they're not only learning this piece, but they're learning that you can break apart a piece. They're learning that you can take a part of a piece and put it with something else and expand that piece into something more. Um, so anyway, so this is the, the first part of the piece. That's the melody. Then there's what's become an improv section. Why did it become an improv section? First of all, because I needed to expand it. Secondly, I couldn't read it that well on the page. I just didn't have that capability. I was an adult, but I didn't know how to read music very well. But I noticed that it had a characteristic, because it was a composer, I noticed that, that it had a characteristic of a bass line. And that created a structure I knew that I could improvise on. That would allow me to go even if, even if I read. I, even if I just repeated the notes, it could become an improvisation. I'm just.
just repeating the notes and making them a little bit more embellished. That it gave me, and I could be musical with that. This simple thing allowed me to be musical. I could play that and then it could come back to the melody. I could go back to that improv section. So then I began to realize, wow, this is not just a structure that I can make up stuff, but it's like an adventure. I can take it as I can keep going further and further with it. And when I get lost, or when I think the audience thinks that I'm lost, I can come back and say, no, 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 I know what I'm doing. Well, wait a minute. Oh, I know what I'm doing. And then I discovered a third part of it. I discovered that when I get to the bottom of this, if I get to the bottom of this and I play the chord that is actually under that, that would require me to shift this one lever. I discovered that if I played that chord, I kept the bass the same and I moved the top chord up. I got this dramatic chord that just like, whoa, I could have so much fun with that. And I could, I could do it in either direction. And then I discovered I could sit on that chord and I could explore it. So I discovered that even in the, even on the job, I could be practicing my arpeggios and all kinds of things. I could move it. I could, I could just do all this stuff. And then I could come back and play the melody. So I discovered that there were these three parts and, and I could play with them and I could put, I could, I could start out with this. It was just, uh, it was like a dramatic section. Melody, improvise, improv. Sorry, I have to do that. And these these con musical concepts were being expressed. I mean, I could express these musical concepts at my level. So that was step one. That was phase one of this piece. There were then many other phases that ended up having it sound like this. <laughs> which is just a different styling of the dramatic section than a melody that's like this. And then actually making even more contrast. That's the improv section. So, but the piece has built and built and built and built over time. Like if you were living in a house and you, you know, there's this beautiful house and you just keep building it and you keep living in it in a new way. So what I'm teaching in the challenge <laughs> is the breakdown. And then you said, um, you said, well, yeah, but what, and then are you also learning the concept of this? So the concept of this is you can take a tiny melody and you can combine it with an improv section. So you said you were learning Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring. Just stop me if I'm stop me if I'm going, shall I stop here? Yes, yeah, stop right there for just a minute. Because okay. you've said a lot. I mean, okay. I, I mean you've said a lot. So you know I want to go back to um something that you said when we were talking but um kind of formulating what we what our question was today. Mm -hmm. And you said that part of the way that Baroque flamingo even Beget flamingo. <laughs> I want to say flamingo like the bird, but it's flamingo like the, the Spanish the dancer, dancer. Right? Okay, I caught myself. Um, there's got to be something in that that's relevant to what we're talking about this morning about the flamingo flamenco. Yeah, there's people. Be it's so funny. People do it all yeah. the time, and uh, yeah, I'm just wondering about how the spirits, the spirit of 
the flamingo bird is connected to the flamingo dancers and guitar style. Anyway, that's for another, that's another musing. Um, one of the things that you said is that uh, when you began to play with what became Baroque Flamenco, that you were learning um, a song and that you could read the kind of the A part yeah, enough to play it like it yep. was written. But right. when it got to the B part, it it was a little bit for me, I do the eye rolls. <laughs> My yeah. sister plays piano and is a great right. sight reader and she'll show me things she's playing. And I just, you know, it's the, I can't do anything right. with it. There's, I mean, it's just beyond my, my expertise. And so the part B I'm, I'm having my eye roll to imagining that right. was the equivalent to your response, but you recognized the baseline. You recognized what right. the baseline was doing. And so you realized that you could play the baseline and improvise over it. So that the initial deconstruction came mm -hmm. because you were you were drawn to play a piece and mm -hmm. learn it. I mean, mm -hmm. there was something about it that was calling you to learn it. But there was a place where you couldn't yet master it as it was but you didn't want that to stop you so you took the part you yeah. could assimilate yeah and i love this word of ma mastering because um i thought you were going to say match that you couldn't yet match what was on the page um it's because it's so interesting i mean that may be another part of this conversation or another because mastery for me is that you you actually are one with something mm -hmm. but not necessarily one with it as somebody else thinks you should be one with mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and 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 the other thing i've realized as a as a grown-up composer is what's on the page may not be at all i mean especially decades decades later maybe one moment of one performance of this mm -hmm. piece mm -hmm. but anyway right i could not yet master the notes that were written on the page but I knew enough. Have, so I was a composer my whole life, even though I couldn't write out music. Don't ask how, but it happens more often than you think. Um, and so I could recognize the pattern. And I knew I had played with that pattern. I mean, you know, same, it's, it's the same pattern. It's, it's, a, it's, it's just a, you know, you know, it's like that moment when people are dancing. It, that's, I, saw, I saw that pattern in the music, I could see that at the bottom of the notes and I recognized it and was like, okay, I, I think I know I, I can do something with this. Yeah. So let's, let me speak yeah. for a minute because I think the distinction you're making about mastery is a good one. I, I, um, and part of the distinction as I'm hearing it is if I master my ability to be present with how all of my um, training to be a therapist and a psychoanalyst, mm -hmm. as well as my experience as a human being informs me about it, then the mastery I have of how I do psychoanalysis is specific to me. Mm -hmm. It is not the mastery of Jung's way of doing it mm -hmm. or von Franz's way of doing it or Lacan's way, these big name. It's my way. Now, I am in their tradition, but the mastery I have is of my own self and presence in relationship to it. So master, what you're saying mastery for you is, is that, and what that means is that's very different than mastery of being able to read the the music. I would love to sight read like my sister does, yeah. but, but that's just not going to happen. Can I jump back to something that you just said? When yeah. when you were you when you were saying I'm not young and I'm not this person not yeah. that person that person, and then I and then I realized and then you but you said you know who you are and I realized that part of the value of who you are is that you are that person in direct relationship to your clients, mm -hmm. and anyone who plays a piece of music is bringing a version alive of it in yes. alive in this moment. And I, I, because I was thinking, you know, like, yeah, the big, the big thing with them is your clients don't actually, they, they're not going to meet Jung. They're not going to meet this person. Oh, but wait, they get to meet you. They have that relationship with you. And it's just making me realize once again, 
why each person who plays a piece, it's not their responsibility to play it perfectly. That's not the thing. Their responsibility is to make that connection. They provide the living connection. And so the mastery is just finding something you can embody comfortably. So now we're to deconstruction need sometimes be necessary before liftoff, because if mastery in my mind stays with doing it, like I think Jung would have done it or this person or this person, Mm -hmm. then I'm going to get paralyzed. Mm -hmm. If I want to play a piece of music and I have struggled enough with this in Irish jam sessions, (laughs) um, coming to the harp as, as an Mm -hmm. adult learner, um, you know, if I have to play it just like somebody else plays it, then I'm going to automatically freeze mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. my own experience and where I am, let's just say with the harp as an adult learner mm-hmm. is very different than lifelong players. Like my sister reading music since junior high or my husband playing, you know, being a professional folk musician and playing mm-hmm. for decades, it's going to be different. But if my lift off has gotten deconstructed from the way they're doing it, the way it's written to my relationship to it and my experience of it and my mastery of feeling it and expressing the structure of it, Mm -hmm. that's true to the tune. If I'm going to call it that tune, Mm -hmm. then I'm going to be able to lift off. I'm going to be able to share, to play, to right do whatever I do right? so that part of perhaps the deconstruction that's necessary is what is it we're trying to master? Yeah, that's interesting. So, right. And, and as you were talking, I was thinking um, there are so many things here. So first of all, a tune is a sequence of notes and I never could remember long sequences. I mean, I, does it go up to, I can tell it, go, I could, whatever, hard to, I can't do that. Um, and so, but I can remember a shape, easily remember a shape. And to me, this is a shape. A tune is probably a shape too. And a, and a, a person who knows how to re- memorize tunes probably memorizes it as a shape as well. So the tune is a single thing rather than a sequence. Maybe, I don't know, cause I can't do that. But, um, but it's easy for me to, and in Baroque flamenco in the class, we literally draw a picture of what this piece looks like. There's a picture of it in my brain. So if I can remember, if I know that that's the only thing I have to remember for the second part, then I can be present. And if I know that I can do it as slow or as fast as I want, I can be present. And if I know that I have a safe place to come back to if I get lost, I can be present. And so this really works very well when you're playing alone. It can also work if you, when you're playing with others, if you are both in agreement on what are the, what's the, fa- what's the structure that you're playing together. Right. Yeah. I know yeah. we, I see we got a comment. We always get excited when we get comments. Yeah. <laughs> am I, am I mastering? <laughs> Such a great question. Well, well, um, and I'll pull Francis back up in a second, but yeah, this is such a great question. Am I mastering the instrument, a tune, a right. culture, or, or myself? I mean, something, or am I, am I, am I, so yeah, that is such a great question. And I think for me, I mean, ah, oh, part of music is, well, stories in music is what's so important to me and being able to express a character, character or a character. Uh Uh-oh, you're looking sideways. Did the, somebody come to your house? Is the dog barking? All right, take it away. I'll, uh, I can. She's not barking yet, but if I disappear and I'm muted, it's because she's starting to bark. (laughs) Okay. We should have told you this at the beginning. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to say this before I have to sign off if she barks. Mastery. I I think the mastering is mastering one's own presence in relationship to, because my mastery of the instrument, a tune or a culture today I've been thinking about tunes I've been playing now for eight or 10 years and how fluid they are and how I'm able to improvise. And I'm much more creative with the um, left hand um, accompaniment than I was before. So I think that the mastery that leads to liftoff is 
the mastery and the moment. This is what I can get to in the moment. And Jung mm. says regarding psychoanalysis, and I think this is true about life and it's true about sharing our music or sharing whatever, our thoughts, our feelings. Oh, I'm <laughs> going to have to mute. All right. I will try to answer the rest of, um, of Kathleen's, what she was going to say. I don't know what she was going to say, but I suspect uh, since I know that, you know, she's built an uh, online embodiment circle that, and I would say that mastery for me is be, again, being able to be present in the moment. Ah, uh, and, oh, and with the dog, <laughs> do you want to finish your, what you were going to say, Kathleen? Yeah, so Jung says this regarding um, working as a psychoanalyst, but I think this is true regarding being a human being and sharing, um, mm -hmm. whether it's our creative project or our feeling mm -hmm. or communicating with the partner, mm -hmm. is that if we are going to become more conscious, we have to be comfortable realizing that what I say today and what I feel to be the truth and share today, it's going to be different tomorrow or next year or in five years that it's not static, it's not fixed. So we have to be willing to quote, be wrong is what that also means. We have to be willing to say, this is the best mastery I have today, but it doesn't mean it's gonna be the best mastery I have all my life, you know, or this is what I see and believe now, or this is what I express. Oh. So I think it has something to do with getting comfortable with being present. Right with all that we are today and knowing that's enough that's enough right right so i'm going to pull i'm going to pull up this other co comment and then i'd love i'd love to take this for a minute um thank you this is beautiful yes music is life um and more on that for the rest of my life um so one of the things kathleen you were saying you know it's gonna things are gonna change mastery it can change um, and I, I remember this as a kid, my mother was always taking singing lessons and she'd always say, well, we used to think this about the voice, but now we know this. And like the second or third time I heard this, I was like, what, in what world? I, you used to think that and now you think this is true? Like, don't you think that eventually you're gonna think that's false? But one of the things that I love about this particular piece and the role that it's played in my life. So remember, this was one of the, the, the fundamentals, the, the melody, the, this, the bass line. It was my first experience of improvisation on the harp. It was my first experience of musically in an in an environment in which i felt very uncomfortable physically i wasn't had no coordination and yet i was it being presented i mean i had to make a living i was playing in a for fine dining um and so it was the first moment when i discovered what i would call a home free it was like a place you could come to that you would be safe in the midst of improvisation and exploration i discovered that this coming back to this melody th the melody became safety and then the ability to come and explore that bass line the piece if you heard me playing in that dining room and you heard me playing with a con orchestra today like i did in salzburg last year oh i didn't play it somebody else played it i got to watch actually which is even greater so imagine i'm playing it in a dining room and then you know decades later i'm sitting and watching somebody else play the concerto that i created out of that to me the piece is still exactly the same it is just expanded just like we do but the fundamentals of the piece are the same and that's why i love teaching it and the fundamentals of the piece translate to other pieces as well. So the so there, there's the musical fundament, fund, fundamentals of it, but there's the conceptual fundamentals. The conceptual fundamentals are you can have a safety, a little a, a tune that is recognizable, alternated with an improv section. And I'm seeing we're getting lots of comments. I want to look at them. And I want to show this one thing because you were talking, you were saying, and you also talked about completion, mastery and completion. I am so passionate about pe people being able to experience that at early levels of technical ability by being able to connect with a sense of completion, even with, I'm always showing, you know, you can do this with two fingers.
I mean, you don't need huge technical ability to be musical or to be creative. This is Pat. I'm. This is important to me because people start playing music and they all keep thinking, "I got to do more. I got to do more. I, I, I'm going to have to do this in order to be able to be expressive." And it's not true. But what you said was, "I'm. I've been playing the beginning of Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring, and I've been trying to learn the second part of it." And I was, and I was saying, "You don't have to. <laughs> you can make a full, complete piece out of the first part of." Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring by doing exactly the same thing we do in Baroque Flamenco. And in fact, by actually taking the improv from Baroque Flamenco and using it with Yesu, Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring. Do you doubt me? Would you like me to show you that you can? Or I shall we? Want you to sh I want you to show us. And then I want us to read the comments. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So this is me playing the best version I can of Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring. much like the first. That's the melody. Now I'm going to play the improv of Baroque Flamenco. You see the bass line. arpeggios if I wanted. I could repeat that if I wanted. Yeah, I will repeat it because I'll end it. And this last time I'll do something just slightly different. Instead of going all the way down, back up one step. And now I can come back to that melody. Now, I'm just curious. To me, I'm, I'm doing exactly the same thing as I did with Baroque Flamenco. I'm playing a melody. I'm alternating it with an improv section. Is that how it sounded to you? I mean, do you see that? And do you feel like, oh, I could do that? What I felt is it was seamless. It just naturally, it naturally flowed from it. And so, yes, I do imagine I could do that. Okay. And I think that, you know, part of um, when I mentioned to you all when we were um, mm -hmm. still off camera about Yesu is I've been, you know, I've been working on this piece mm -hmm. for the last year and a half. And when I was playing it last week, I keep saying to myself, oh, I need to learn part B. And then I thought, well, what difference does it make? I love part A. And, and I, it, it's. <laughs> She loves part A. She may have to leave to deal with the dog. Um, so I'm hearing that she's, and um, and so so that is complete. Okay, go on, Kathleen. So I realized what I love it. So play right. it. It's speaking to me. Right. And I think that part of what you're saying and what you teach so often and reiterate in various ways mm -hmm. in Hip Hop Academy is if this is speaking to you, then play it and continue to play with what speaks to you from right. the song. And that was part of what you just showed um, with, with pairing Yesu with part of Baroque Flamingo. Right. And, 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 and it also, um, if you want, and so often we have a part of a piece that we love, like you love that you would love to play it over and over again. And yet if people are listening, that can become it can become irritating. However, if you alternate it, like you learned to do in Baroque Flamenco, if you alternate it with something, then instead of it feeling like it's a repetition, it starts feeling like it's a return. And it starts having a really powerful emotional um, return sense. And what's interesting about pairing Yesu of Joy of Man's Desiring with the Baroque Flamenco improv section and I won't go into this. It's their their relative major and relative minor, and I will not say more about that. No, no. But there. Yeah, let's not go any further. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's not I'm confusing. Just, things. I'm just telling you, you can do it. And there's just one little thing you have to change. Um. So uh, let's let's pull up this um this comment here, which I only see, um, 
Okay, great. Um, Okay, for, I'm going to pull them up. Oh, oh, we've got a lot of them. Okay, so let's see if we can read this. I'm a guitarist from Venezuela. I watch every masterclass and I take advantage of it. Great. The guitar is also an arpeggio. I love this musical and educational work. That's beautiful. Yes, yes. And the guitar has been such a powerful influence for me. And it's why I was so determined to learn to just take some of that, the drama of the guitar and the drama. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the ability to create rhythm has been so inspiring and trying to take even a little bit of that onto the harp has been wonderful. And uh, there's so many things about the guitar that I love. Um, and, and Magda is saying, um, I am using these concepts in my instrument. Brilliant, B wonderful, wonderful. Um, and, let, and Magda is saying, I do not write in English. Uh, oh, I'm using an online translator, but I understand what you say. Another thing about music, yes, all, we can understand each other as musicians. Um, and Victoria, hello, as an agile practitioner, and I don't know what agile is, um, I learned the value of iteration and aim to create a minimum. And okay, I love this because this is also what we are doing. This is what I'm doing all the time in Hip Harp Academy, creating a minimum viable product. Now, the thing about music is a minimum viable product is has just as much capacity for self-expression as whatever is, you know, more bells and whistles. Or, and I don't mean that, that but, 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 but it's really incredible how minimum viable in art is not necessarily less than max, the maximum. I, I don't know why, but that's a fascinating thing. And this is so great. Um, exactly. I learned the value of, of iteration. In other words, yes, when you get that minimum viable, then through doing it over and over, it expands. You start to learn what it needs. I mean, I'm putting words in your mouth, but I learned the value of iteration and aim to create a minimum viable product rather than the perfect product. Ah. <sighs> I am. I love this so much because I am so struggling with this right now in publishing the pieces that I've finished. Because now I'm struggling with how is it okay for me to to share a minimum viable, not perfect completion, and afraid that people will say, "Yeah, but you didn't write it out right." Anyway, that's my thing. Um, so I actually get something out to the market per se. If it's good enough for today, then it's good enough for now. Yes, and and what's good enough means. People can hear it now. They can engage with it. It's alive rather than stuck in our heads in which there's this myth of perfection. Kathleen, I'm blathering. Keep, <laughs> take it away. Yes, we have a little growling going on in the background here. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, and I'm aware of our time, so we're going to have to mm -hmm. come to a close for today. I, the minimum viable product, what I immediately thought about was the essence. So often yes. we come back to like, what's the essence? What is it that's most important? Um, you know, another way to say it for our personal life is what is heart and soul and meaning? And knowing that what has heart and soul and meaning is what matters. And that often it is the minimal that allows that to show, show through more clearly than when we try to dress it all up and mm -hmm. embellish it and make it big. And mm -hmm. I think when you said you discovered that going home can give you the safety to explore in the improv, mm -hmm. I think in a way it's that once there's something in a set form and there's an iteration, there is this kind of minimal structure that does provide then a safety and a foundation. Right. And so then one can venture out from that and come back to it. So, yeah. I would, um, f for me today, I'm going to remember that if I show up with the minimal variable product I am, um, that perhaps that means really letting my heart, soul, and meaning of that lead and not covering it up, trying to make it bigger than it is or smaller than it is oh. or um, hiding it under embellishments that distract from the natural beauty of the minimal viable product, which is the meaning that has heart and soul for me. 
I love that so much. And I feel like that that is what I am getting to in this in this challenge. I'm gonna pull up the QR code for people to actually join this, join the challenge. Um, it is a harp challenge, but there have been people with other instruments who've entered it. Uh, entered it. I remember a bassoonist entered and played this Baroque flamenco, which was a, really fun to see. What I'm hearing that I love so much, Kathleen, and I think why I love this piece so much and why I love teaching the essence of it in this challenge. And the challenge here is to make it easy, to allow it to be easy instead of going, instead of seeing all the embellishments, actually see the heart and soul of this piece. And what I love is that because the piece grew with me and because it exists like we do in our simplest form, it has taught me to be able to enjoy the, the, the expansion of it as my fingers can do it, and, but then knowing that that doesn't have to be. I don't have to be able to do this in order to express that or even this. Like th 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 that self-expression can come out all the way along, all, all the way along. So thank you. Um, I, I, I really hope that anyone that anyone who plays the harp, I hope you will join this challenge. And I hope you will tell me like, Kathleen, thank you so much for helping me see that, you know, I need to break it down even more or how, when I'm kind of going into an, another world and everybody else, you know, ask me questions so that I can, I can learn to deconstruct in a way that I can bring this peace and this concept and this experience to everyone. Yeah. 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 Do you want to pull up our last comment? Yes. Um, comments, and then we'll need to sign off. Yes. Thank okay. you all for being today here today and joining in. Yeah. Thank you. It's been so wonderful to have, um, uh, we're getting beautiful. Oh, great. Okay. All right. So we've got a, okay. A beautiful dream, which is a beautiful, thank you, John. <laughs> and then Connie says, my mom gave birth to me. I'm not a scientist or a professional by any means, but I'm out there and have purpose in my capacity. Yes. I love that purpose in my capacity. I cannot take away from who I am, but I can always add to who I can be. And for now I am in progress and share who I am today. Yes. And, and I do believe that we can also continue to look for that essence and share that essence and, and start to be confident in the power of that essence. And that's another thing that I take away from this, uh, from the practice of playing this piece. So Kathleen and everybody who's been here today, thank you so much for this conversation. It's just had a huge impact on me. And I will take away that, again, this happens in conversation. The understanding and the de deconstruction and the liftoff happens for me in conversation. Yes. Thank you so much. And go forth and harp on the essence of things. And we will see you next week. <laughs>